The Deep Program podcast, ran by me, Second Thought and Hakim, is now available on YouTube. Find the link below. This channel is 100% sponsor-free and independent. Consider supporting it in staying so by donating over on Patreon. Thank you. Most of you first heard of this term in the past month or two, as it was being paraded over social media as well as official diplomatic channels between Ukraine, Russia and the United States. But as everything on Twitter, Facebook and YouTube, the story itself is far older and more complicated than what can fit in 140 characters. While the process of rewriting history has been a crown jewel in the strategy of building up neoliberal capitalism in every corner of the world, where creating something more than malls and pop icons was attempted, I'd like to take you on a journey specifically through Yugoslavia, a prime example of this falling from grace. All of you probably know about the Balkan Wars, up until recently the bloodiest conflict in Europe since World War II. Which, by the way, is funny how with every new war, us Eastern Europeans become less of a construction worker and more of a white European, something, you know, everyone seemingly forgets a few years after we've played the role of oppressor or oppressed for their cameras. But anyways, at first glance, the war in Yugoslavia had turned ethnicities of seemingly indistinguishable cultures, literal neighbors, into sworn enemies overnight. The story, though, as always, is not as black and white, and while it begins with the infant days of Yugoslavia and the birth of its own brand of socialism, the festering fascistic, nationalistic and war-hungry disease it had growing under its floorboards mostly begins with World War II. The Yugoslav Socialist Partisan Resistance Movement of the Second World War was the only fully independent successful resistance movement in Europe, which, with some physical assistance from the Soviet Union, managed to almost completely free its land from occupying fascist forces, as well as local Quisling and monarchist groups. While operating on the Balkan Peninsula, the Nazi strategy for the local, almost tribalistic ethnic divisions was simple. Divide et imperam. Divide and conquer. Потрудитесь разделаться с боснийскими бандитами. Не забывайте, Босния – хорватская земля. Не отдавайте Боснии хорватам. Босния – издавна сербская земля. Смерть хорватам и низким народам. Я, Дража Михайлович и мои четники боремся за великую Сербию. Кстати, господин Михайлович, почему ваши четники носят такие длинные бороды и волосы? Мы все дали клятву не бриться и не стричься до возвращения в Югославию короля Петра. Фюрер гарантирует, что после победы вы будете диктатором в Югославии. А король... Each were promised power, independence and the right to rule by the Nazis, for Serbs a restored monarchy freed from the clutches of Croat Catholics or communist aggression. For the Croatians a purified, racially superior nation accepted into the Third Reich, where a complete cleanse of all perceived lower races, Serbs, Jews and the Roma would be fully supported. And a mixture of both to the Bosniaks who were apparently now some weird mix of uh, Aryan Muslims. This shtick, though, worked so well for the Germans to such an extent that at certain points of the war the greatest resistance to socialist forces were local reactionaries and not even the Germans themselves. War crimes of deafening proportions were committed by all sides with the Croatian Ustasha topping the pile through exceptional Nazi-inspired brutality. This thankfully didn't last forever. With the total and absolute defeat of Germany by the Soviet Union and its allies, the local reactionary forces were left scattered and were soon picked up, put on trial and either arrested or executed by the newly established socialist government led by one of the best dressed revolutionaries of all time, Josip Broz Tito, the new Marshal of Yugoslavia. 
All the previously mentioned fascist collaborationist forces were made completely illegal. Their statues torn down, their offices closed, even their graves made anonymous. It was the process of total denazification, but in its true form of the Balkan Peninsula. Something the children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren of those very same fascists would never, ever forget. Built on internationalism as a strong and, in my opinion, both wise and beautiful ideological current to combat internal division, brotherhood and unity became the almost unilateral slogan for the country. The economic system was almost like a larger metaphor of Yugoslavia's position between the East and the West, a Yugoslav-style socialism called worker self-management. Well, it had its fair share of critics both from the East and the West for either being too revisionist, too capitalist or too socialist, it managed to turn a war-torn section of the old continent into one of the most rapidly developing countries in the world. It founded the League of Independent Nations to counter Cold War divisions and built strong ties with the developing world. For all its faults, it was an almost naively beautiful experiment that showed the world what valuing workers' rights, international solidarity and truly listening to the demands of your own population could build. Small local Star Trek, where Muslim, Orthodox and Catholic shared not only a meal together, but the right to manage their workplace and their destiny. This dream, though, in its naivety, didn't last forever. Many put the blame for the war on Yugoslavia's attempt to build an international entity where quote-unquote independent cultures were forced to coexist. This sort of point reeks of quasi-fascist attitudes that try to tell us that ethnic coexistence is somehow impossible. A go-to argument for incels, I mean, uh, ethno-nationalists. No. The death of internationalism came as a direct consequence of decommunization. The death of Yugoslavia's socialism left it open to local and foreign rhetoric of division, and this, in turn, let the region spiral into unrecognizable brutality and a repeat of World War II tribalism. Let's see how. Yugoslavia's dick measuring competition with the USSR wasn't what started the collapse. While objectively inferior in many ways as compared to the state-run model the Soviets had used to manage their economy, Yugoslav worker self-management offered plenty of benefits as well, especially in the post-war era, the creation of consumer goods, and in pragmatically slowing down creeping Western imperialism. Yugoslavia's fall stems from abandoning those very same principles which built the federation up in the first place. To avoid giving you too much of a history lesson, you know, your and my time can be better spent uh, chugging beers and eating pickles, I'll give you a massive oversimplification instead. Quickly, after World War II, the Communist Party of Yugoslavia was renamed the League of Communists and broke away from the idea of a unitary Communist Party under the leadership of Moscow. Worker self-management was defined as the Yugoslav Socialist model, and in the 70s, the federal government gave each republic relative power over their own economic plan instead of making them follow the general federal one innately giving not only cultural, but in a way semi-economic independence to the partially ethnically defined regions. With Tito's death and a massive economic crisis hitting the world, everyone was in pain, and especially Yugoslavia. This already unstable deck of cards started to violently shake, and what did they do? Well, they bought very expensive glue. In the difficult space of balancing between the East and the West, the kind International Monetary Fund reared its ugly head and offered a hand. Yugoslavia, both in its naivety and local private business and political interests, indebted itself with an organization whose main task, at the end of the day, was spreading the capitalist model. Quite literally, you, you can't get a loan from the IMF or the World Bank without liberalizing your economy. Ante Markovic, a lesser-known figure but arguably the greatest individual culprit in helping the West remove the S from SFRJ, not only brought capitalism back through the main door, but directly collaborated with local traders and foreign intelligence agencies in annihilating any hope for a united Yugoslavia. 
Yugoslavia's economic system, for all its faults, was what held the country together. Built on ideals of internationalism and socialism, it seeked to unite already similar people into a common entity, pursuing a goal far more sophisticated than petty tribalistic division. Once any remnants of worker solidarity were cleansed from the country, the new financial elites, formed as a cluster of private businessmen operating with large foreign capital, old party functionaries squabbling for control, organized crime and arguably the worst of the bunch, genuine believers in neoliberalism, took total control over the country. But the financial crisis wasn't gone and it was only getting worse. So, as the old saying goes, when a liberal bleeds, a fascist is born. Now, unable to use class analysis as a tool for bettering the economic downturn, the stern capitalists of this new Yugoslavia needed to explain away the hurt everyone was feeling differently. And what better way to do so but by bringing up old rivalries? The way Putin criticizes the Soviet Union for leading to Russian territorial losses. The way Ukraine redefines fascists in its history as supposed heroes against the despicable Reds. The way the American South explains away slavery as states' rights during the Civil War. So did the Serbs, the Croats, the Bosniak, Albanians, and many others. Serbian Chetnik monarchists became the good guys again, with the former World War II leader Draža Mihailović becoming almost completely reinstated as a national hero. Croatian Ustasha Nazi war crimes were not only undermined, but now completely denied as an attempt to revitalize ideals of Croatian cultural and racial superiority. Josip Broz Tito became the unilateral symbol of poverty, destruction, and anti-patriotic utopianism. If it only wasn't for the communists, which propped up that other nationality, not us, we would have been so great. Replace the long-standing slogan of brotherhood and unity. Decommunization is not only a process in which history is rewritten and new folklore for nation-states is built. It's a continuous process which excuses its own failures, wars, poverty, and mismanagement through the constant go-to patsy that is the fault of the communists. It leads to ethnocentric thought and the quite fascist-esque belief that former glory, having been lost because of the communists, must be taken back, and always taken back from another group. Now, newly born financial elites of the separate Yugoslav republics, in an attempt to consolidate power and wealth, needed to push out their competition as quickly as possible. It was a free-for-all thrift shop of national assets. By being riled up by historically partially unresolved rivalries, the local population, starved and in poverty without a strong leader like Tito at the forefront, bought into the reactionary ideologies local elites were selling them on. A greater Serbia, a clean Croatia, a Muslim Bosnia, and an autonomous Albania. We bought into it. And the rest was history. It's my humble analysis that what we are seeing in Ukraine today was just a postponed Yugoslavia. The internal contradictions of having the communists of the past being a constant patsy for the failures of the new system decade in and decade out eventually led to the conclusion that those past failures must be rectified. And how are ethnic and nationalist disagreements rectified? Well, with war, as I said. Be it defending your own minority in the other country or protecting your own sovereignty or some dingy, insane nationalist shit. The argument can always be sprung for internal and external division. That's the thing with non-class-based conflict. By ignoring certain and completely concentrating on other arguments, you can easily convince your side of the need for war. Decommunization as a constant process is similar to the fascist doctrine of the othering. First it's the communists of old, then it's their legacy, then their history, then their successes, and once decommunization is perceived as being quote-unquote complete, we move on to new others, with LGBTQ plus people being the primary example of Eastern European othering, where they are to this day being used as they perceive the new enemy of cultural destructions which the church and the conservative voting body must defend against. 
or for the liberals, internalize bigotry, spouting about how our very own cultures must be molded to that of the superior Western civilized world. Globalization on steroids, where the poor and uneducated are seen as what's driving the rest down. Once internationalism and class-based economic systems are out of the window, countries turn into squabbling schoolchildren fighting over their lunch by chucking it at each other. Lunch made through the meat grinder of soldiers, civilians' beliefs and purpose. The ones chucking it rarely get punished, and it's the food that ends up in the bin. But, as we all know, nothing lasts forever, and the meat eventually stops jumping into the grinder. Let's just hope it comes sooner than later, and that we, especially those living in places where socialist or anarchist experiments were attempted, learn from our histories instead of erasing them. We were told history ended. We were told capitalist states don't go into direct war against each other. We, as always, when it comes to rhetoric coming from the mouth of those in power, were lied to. There is no capitalism without war. There is no peace without internationalism. The sooner we understand that, the quicker we'll stop dying for colorful cloth and national songs. Thank you for making it to the end of the video. You must be confused because you didn't see any sponsorships. Uh, this must mean you got me doesn't get any. Wrong! I get plenty in my inbox, but in order to keep this channel 100% independent and make videos like this, I rely on the support of my wonderful patrons. If you believe in our cause and the videos I make, please do consider supporting me via Patreon and help me keep telling sponsors to politely F off. Also, don't forget to subscribe and ring that bell. The YouTube algorithm doesn't exactly love political content which isn't absolutely reactionary. That being said, let me take the time to thank all the patrons without whom this wouldn't be possible. Especially Deep Red Wine, Soup, Nathan Moore, B. Matt, Floshi Spin, Nabino, Red Messiah, Fredjden Jarrett, Grim Water, 17, Lilia, Kaylees, Maitake Kun, Tankerkist Posadist, Ian Snyder, Probably Fang, 3NB1, Script, Dead Spartan 08, Jesus Salcero, Red American, Display Name, Marussia Asarabakara, Crouton and Baguette, Salmon Eggs, Neil Surio, Clam and Faiz, User, Alki Historiker, K. Eel, Boyan, Mike Lunning, The Muffin Man, Zane Guevara, The Poltism, Pharda Sullivan, Thomas Rawson Wood, Nikola Radovanovic, Adam Takashe Dong, Sean, Mike Gulyash, Mugicha, Eric Gersowitz, Evie Wren, From Tofu with Soy Sauce, Exploited Human Commodity Guy, Justin Case, Jocelyn Esperanza, Dvornidzak Sonder, Loss, Carl Eric, Patrick Iverson, 